for them. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for your participation in the Critical Issues Forum online teachers workshop. For those who are watching the recorded lecture, thank you very much for watching the video. Today, I am delighted to have Ms. Sarah Bidgood, the Director of Eurasia Nonproliferation Program at the James Madden Center for Nonproliferation Studies. And today's lecture title is Nuclear Weapons in the World, Where Are We? How Did We Get Here? And What Might the Future Hold? The lecture is going to give you an overview of the current nuclear weapons status in the world. So now, let me briefly introduce Sarah. Sarah's research focuses on US-Soviet and US-Russia uh, non-proliferation cooperation, as well as the international non-proliferation regime more broadly. So she kindly agreed to give one more lecture on the US-Russia uh, relations. So she's the co-editor of the book, uh, Once and the Future Partners, the United States, Russia, and Nuclear Non-Proliferation, which was published by International Institute for Strategic Studies in 2018. She also leads the Young Women's in Non-Proliferation Initiative at CNS. So I hope CIF students, especially female students, to follow this amazing initiative. And uh, I would like to encourage you to continue to study this non-proliferation issues once you go to college. So Sarah earned her BA in Russia from Wellesley, Wellesley College. She also holds an MA in Russian, East European and Eurasian studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an MA in Non-Proliferation and Terrorism Studies from the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. So I'm very happy to have Sarah for the CIF uh, project. Thank you for your cooperation. And so now, Sarah, I'm going to give you a microphone. Great. Um, thank you so much, Masako. And it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. It's the third year in a row that I've, I've had the pleasure of participating in the Critical Issues Forum. Um, and I'm delighted to, to be here. So as Masako said in her very kind introduction, um, this today's lecture is going to focus on sort of giving us a lay of the land. So understanding where we are with respect to nuclear weapons today, you know, a little bit of the history of how we got here and what it is that the future uh, might hold. So obviously this is a very wide ranging topic and um, it sounds like you'll have the opportunity to delve into some of the more specific elements of it uh, as time goes on. So um, just to sort of provide you a bit of a roadmap of, of some of the issues that I hope to cover. Um, first, we're gonna look a little bit at where we are today. <clears throat> so we'll look at the status of global nuclear arsenals, what um, capabilities different countries have, and what the proliferation of, of these weapons has looked like over time. We'll talk a little bit about how it is that we got here. So, you know, what are some of the theories that kind of underpin the proliferation of, of nuclear weapons, both vertically and horizontally. And we'll look at some of the um, tools that have been put in place over time to prevent the spread of these weapons in the degree to which they've been successful. And then we're gonna sort of end by looking at, you know, where it is that we might be able to go from here. So what does the future of some of these treaties look like? What are some of the challenges that um, I think we'll continue to see as time goes on? And, and then we can go into Q&A. So um, let's start by looking at the status of global nuclear arsenals. So this is a very helpful graphic um, that the Arms Control Association, which is a, a great organization to look at if you're um, if you're interested in kind of learning some more about, about these, um, about the lay of the land. So as you can see, the United States and, and the Russian Federation even today continue to possess about 90% of the global uh, nuclear weapons in the world. And together they have about 15,000 uh, nuclear warheads. Um, and about 96 or 9,600 of these are in military service and the rest of them are awaiting dismantlement. So these are ones that have been uh, deployed. And you can see by looking at the map here that all of the other um, uh, seven countries that possess nuclear weapons um, have significantly fewer than either the United States or Russia. So really on orders of magnitude fewer. And 
Um, this is part of the reason why it's so challenging to do what we call multilateral arms control, where we um, bring in countries besides the United States and Russia and try to ask them to reduce the size of their nuclear arsenals. Um, because as you can see, there are such discrepant levels of, of um, nuclear capability between the two largest nuclear weapon states and all of the rest of them, that it's really challenging to figure out kind of how to engage them um, in, in this process. So I'll also note here that, you know, we're looking at nine nuclear weapon states. So the US, the UK, France, Israel, Pakistan, India, Russia, China, and North Korea. You can see them on the screen. Um, but only five of these countries are actually, um, you know, so-called uh, legal nuclear weapon states, which is a status ascribed to them by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which we'll talk about in a, in a later slide. And these are the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Russia, um, and China. And so interestingly enough, these are also the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. And they're the countries that tested prior to, to 1967. Um, and we'll get into why that number is significant uh, in a later slide. But that does mean that um, when we talk about um, the, the challenges with respect to global disarmament, India, Pakistan, and Israel are kind of outside, and North Korea are, are outside of the um, sort of multilateral regimes that um, ascribe some disarmament commitment to the other five permanent members of the UN Security Council. So um, I also want to make a note here about nuclear testing. So one of the ways that countries um, sort of emerge as nuclear weapon states is by testing a nuclear weapon. And um, there have been a many, many, many nuclear weapon tests over time. There is now sort of a de facto global norm in place that countries by and large subscribe to where they don't test nuclear weapons anymore. And part of the reason for that is uh, the conclusion of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Um, and so again, we'll talk a little bit more about what that organization does in, in a later slide and what the future for it might look like. But I wanted to be sure to note that um, that treaty is not yet in force. There are 44 countries that need to ratify it in order for it to enter into force. Um, and there are seven uh, countries that, or rather eight countries that have yet to do so, the so-called Annex II countries, uh, which include the United States. And once that happens, the treaty uh, banning nuclear tests anywhere in the world will, will come into force. Um, in the meantime, though, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization has a very robust um, international monitoring system that is comprised of you know, well over 300 different monitoring stations that are positioned around the world. These are capable of detecting seismic signals that would be emitted by a nuclear explosion or um, you know, radionuclides that would be emitted as a result of a nuclear explosion and infrasound um, and hydroacoustic signals that would let us know that a country had carried out a clandestine test. Um, and you can see the efficacy of this international monitoring system on, on the screen here. So these are the seismic uh, signals of each of North Korea's um, nuclear tests through 2016. Um, and so the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization's international monitoring system was able to pick all of these up, uh, which I think is a, a pretty clear indication of, of its sensitivity and the degree to which it functions in the way that it's supposed to. Um, so with respect to non-proliferation, so non-proliferation of course means, you know, preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. And um, it can mean a couple of different things. Sometimes we talk about vertical proliferation, which means that countries which already possess nuclear weapons, so some of the ones that we looked at on, on that first slide, um, are developing, you know, new types of nuclear weapons or building up their numbers of nuclear weapons. That's the vertical um, type of proliferation. But then we also talk about horizontal proliferation, which means the spread of nuclear weapons to countries that don't yet have them. And that could mean you know, that these countries are developing their own indigenous technology that could lead to a bomb, or it could mean that they're buying that technology or that know-how from other countries. Um, but when we look at the non-proliferation regime as a whole, it's designed to, to prevent both of these types of proliferation, vertical and horizontal. Um, so this picture that I have here is an image of, of, you know, the lead negotiators for the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which was concluded 
to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear capability um, to great acclaim. It was really a huge accomplishment in, in terms of, of uh, multilateral nonproliferation. Um, and as you probably know and have heard about in the news, the United States has now pulled out of this agreement um, and Iran is slowly ratcheting up the degree to which it is um, no longer adhering to its obligations under, under this agreement. So um, one of the big challenges um, for us who work in this space is to figure out what to do in the wake of the kind of uncertain future of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Our partner countries um, are still, you know, by and large adhering to this agreement and trying to uphold their end of the deal, but without the United States there as kind of the linchpin, um, it's becoming more and more difficult to do this. So uh, there are several countries that, you know, we can talk about in Q&A that um, I, I am interested to see whether they will sort of consider proliferating in the future, but they have the capabilities and the know-how to do so. And in some cases, the, the motive to do so and um, Iran is one of the ones that, that we'll have to kind of keep an eye on and see how that evolves in the wake of the demise of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, if, if that is in fact what happens. Um, so, you know, how did we get here? There are a lot of reasons, um, you know, why it is that countries choose to develop nuclear weapons and why uh, we now have nine countries that possess nuclear weapons in the world. Um, uh, you know, as we know, in, in the United States, they were the first to, to the first and only to use nuclear weapons in war um, uh, at the end of World War II. And we've been lucky that we have not seen another advent of the use of nuclear weapons, you know, since then. And I would say that in that time, a very robust um, norm against the use of nuclear weapons has developed, but that's something that you know, is held into place by international agreements and multilateral agreements, and those norms can erode if those multilateral regimes are, are weakened. Um, but, you know, part of the reason why there was such a significant buildup of, of nuclear weapons um, early on in the Cold War period, of course, is the emergence of mutually assured destruction as a kind of underpinning theory for, um, for you know, how one would deter a nuclear attack and how we would maintain strategic stability between the United States and the Soviet Union. So, um, you know, both the United States and the Soviet Union quickly realized after the sort of initiation of the nuclear age that if they were able to reach a point where um, they both had so many nuclear weapons that uh, if you were to attack first, you would be met with a retaliatory strike that would be so devastating that it would destroy your country and sort of decapitate your government, um, that that should deter you from conducting an initial strike and that should be the way to preserve stability. But of course, um, you know, even if that logic makes sense, it means you have to have enough nuclear weapons to be able to deliver a devastating, you know, retaliatory strike and you have to have nuclear weapons that are not just based in one location, but that are, you know, located in, in the air or on a submarine so that you can be sure that you would be able to launch a devastating attack, even if you were attacked first. Um, and so all of that means, uh, you know, both a very large number of nuclear weapons and a very diverse type of delivery systems were necessary to, to be able to um, uh, sort of uphold the idea of mutually assured destruction. And of course that led to arms racing. Um, so you might sort of be surprised to know that the slide that we looked at earlier that showed the global nuclear stockpiles, um, even though the United States and, and, and the Russian Federation still possess around 90% of the global nuclear arsenal, the huge numbers of weapons that they still have represents about an 84% reduction from their Cold War height. So even though there's a very long way to go, you know, there was a time during the height of the Cold War and the height of a mutually assured destruction kind of um, thinking as a driving strategy for nuclear development where that number was much, much higher. And so as we've, um, we've sort of, as Cold War tensions have lessened and, and you know, the, the Cold War itself has ended, we've been able to steadily reduce the numbers of nuclear weapons that both of our countries have um, while still feeling like we're able to maintain a credible second strike capability and to deter an attack from, from
from our adversaries. Um, so one of the things we can talk about later is the degree to which that dynamic is now changing as tensions between the United States and Russia ratchet up again and what that might mean for prospects for nuclear arms racing. So <clears throat> one of the ways that the United States and the Soviet Union were able to reduce their nuclear weapons and the number of nuclear weapons that they had was um, through the conclusion of arms control agreements. And arms control here can mean a couple of different things. We often conflate it with um, reducing the number of nuclear weapons that a country has, but it can also mean you know, eliminating an entire class of, of nuclear weapons in a verifiable way, or it can mean putting limits on certain behaviors that could lead to the buildup of nuclear arms. So, um, uh, you know, following the Cuban Missile Crisis, but moving into the detente period in, in Russian and Soviet and U.S. history, um, there was really a recognition from, from the leadership in both countries that the arms race simply wasn't sustainable and that um, by building up these huge numbers of weapons, you were really inviting um, miscalculations and miscommunications that could lead to the inadvertent use of nuclear weapons. So not even just the deliberate use, but an accidental use of nuclear weapons um, that could very quickly spiral out of control in an environment where there was kind of no trust between the two, the two countries. And so the result was um, the initiation of various arms control agreements that were designed either to eliminate certain types of weapons or eliminate certain numbers of weapons, or as in the case of the 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, you know, get rid of a delivery system that could be used to deliver nuclear weapons uh, in a way that would be particularly destabilizing for, for the U.S.-Soviet relationship. Um, for over 50 years, we've had these types of arms control agreements in place. And um, again, as the relationship between the United States and Russia starts to deteriorate, we're seeing the kind of dismantling of this arms control architecture. Um, and as we'll talk about in a later slide, um, that really has the potential to create an environment where there are incentives to build up the number of nuclear weapons and the type of nuclear weapons and very few constraints um, that could limit that uh, moving forward. So when I talk to you guys again on Friday, we'll be talking about um, you know, US-Soviet cooperation on arms control issues and on non-proliferation issues more broadly. So I'll kind of go into some more of that then, but it's important to know that that um, this engagement between the United States and the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation is always something that has underpinned the broader non-proliferation regime and has really been a linchpin of, of progress in this area. And I have you know, serious concerns, as do many people, about what is going to happen um, to the future of the regime without that engagement between, between the two countries. Um, so one of these treaties that, that you know, we talk about the, the non-proliferation regime and the thing at the cornerstone of it is the non-proliferation treaty. So this agreement was concluded in, in 1968 and um, it was, it's a multilateral treaty, but it really was negotiated um, by and large between the United States and the Soviet Union. So the two delegations worked together very, very closely to um, conclude a treaty that uh, they as nuclear weapon states found palatable and that they felt that the non-nuclear weapon states, so countries that do not possess nuclear weapons, would have some incentive to sign on to. And the way that they did this is they struck what we call, you know, a grand bargain. So um, in Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the five states that I mentioned at the outset of the presentation, so these are also the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, um, they agree that they're not, that they're going to move towards nuclear disarmament uh, in general and complete disarmament by undertaking good faith negotiations that will lead to this end. So that's the commitment that they make. And then non-nuclear weapon states agree that they're not going to acquire or try to develop nuclear weapons um, in exchange for access to the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. So um, they have an inalienable right that's codified under the treaty to be able to use you know, nuclear power reactors and um, research reactors to, to develop isotopes that can be used in medicine and things like that. 
um, but they have to commit that they're not going to misuse those tools and equipment in order to, to develop a nuclear weapon. Um, so we're approaching the 50th anniversary of the entry into force of this treaty, which was in 1970. And we'll talk a little bit later about, you know, how that sort of cues us up for a contentious, um, but very Im symbolically important um, review of the treaty that's going to happen next year. Um, but this is, this is, again, you know, an indication of the extent to which U.S.-Soviet cooperation is really um, kind of the buttress underneath the whole non-proliferation regime uh, writ large of which this treaty is, is the cornerstone. Um, so I mentioned previously that, you know, banning, that nuclear testing is, is important to the development of nuclear weapons. It's something that countries will often use to articulate that they've kind of arrived on the scene as a, as a nuclear weapon state. We've seen that with North Korea. Um, and therefore, prohibiting nuclear testing is, is something that is really important to preventing the spread of, of nuclear weapons. It prevents countries that already possess them from um, developing new capabilities that would require explosive testing. And it also prevents countries that do not yet have nuclear weapons from developing them and from demonstrating that they have this capability. Um, so again, you know, you can see here that the United States and the Soviet Union have undertaken a lot of nuclear weapons tests over, over history. Um, and on orders of magnitude, again, more than, more than the other, other nuclear weapon states. Um, and really since, you know, 1998, the only country that has tested nuclear weapons is North Korea. So the United States and, and the Soviet Union and then the Russian Federation um, have undertaken moratoria that they're not going to conduct these tests. Um, and they also negotiated uh, a number of test ban treaties that were designed to prohibit certain types of testing in certain atmospheres. Um, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban uh, Treaty is the most recent of these. It was concluded in 1996, but as I mentioned previously, it still hasn't entered into force because these eight uh, states need to ratify it in order for that to happen. Um, uh, the Russian Federation is one of these countries and it has already ratified the treaty but the United States has only signed it. They haven't ratified it. Um, Bill Clinton tried to get it ratified in the Senate in 1999, um, and this you know, fell through after a very short period of consideration and not a lot of debate. And um, no other president since then has, has either tried to or been successful in getting the treaty ratified. So we'll have to kind of see where that goes from here. But um, certainly there's no question that banning nuclear testing is something that is really important to preventing the spread of, of nuclear weapons, um, both up and out. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about kind of where it is that, that we can go from here. So um, I started by mentioning um, the importance of US Russian and US Soviet cooperation on arms control issues as one of the key steps to preventing uh, the spread of nuclear weapons. And this continues to be true today. So these are the two largest nuclear weapon states. And if they're not on the same page, it's really difficult to um, significantly reduce the number of nuclear weapons that exist on this planet. Um, you probably know that the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which I mentioned before, this treaty that was concluded in, in 1987, um, uh, fell apart earlier this year. So um, the United States um, accused the Russian Federation of violating this treaty. Russia maintains that it didn't do that. Um, but the end result was that the U.S. withdrew in, in February of this year. And um, after a six-month period of time in which the two states could have tried to resolve their issues, uh, they were unsuccessful. And so the treaty collapsed in, in August of 2019. So that leaves the New START Treaty, which you can see on the screen here, as the only remaining bilateral arms control treaty um, in existence today. So um, under the treaty, the two countries agree to reduce the number of nuclear weapons that they have to an agreed upon cap. And they have met that cap. Um, and they have a very robust verification regime where they can each check 
um, that the other country has upheld what it said it was going to do under this treaty and they've continued to to do those checks and to work with one another to verify that the treaty is being implemented um, but the treaty is going to expire in 2021 and so um, there is a provision in the treaty that says that if the two presidents of the United States and the Russian Federation, so Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, agree to do so, they can extend the treaty by an additional five-year period. Um, and it doesn't need to go to the Senate in, Russia, in the United States. It doesn't need to go to the Duma in, in the Russian Federation. The two men can just decide that they want to do that, and it will be extended. Um, for those of us who think a lot about the state of US-Russia relations and the impact that the crisis in that relationship has on arms control and non-proliferation issues, um, we're really advocating for the extension of the New START Treaty. So um, we think that it would ascribe uh, an important degree of transparency and predictability in the relationship. So it would sustain interaction, routine interaction between inspectors on both sides, between officials on both sides, that neither side is really getting in another forum. Um, and it would also help to make sure that, you know, neither country would be able to um, go above the cap that they've agreed upon in this treaty. So even though, you know, extending New START wouldn't um, lead to further cuts in nuclear arsenals, um, in either Russia or the United States, it would make sure that that the cap that they agreed to stays in place and that um, even at a time when both countries might be interested in engaging in an arms race, there would be some limit on their ability to do that for at least five years, uh, which would give us time to, to kind of come up with a follow on agreement or to improve the relationship in such a way that um, we wouldn't need to be so worried that there was going to be a nuclear arms race. So extending the treaty is a big priority for people who work in this field like me. Um, and it's, it's a matter of, of time running out and time being of the essence because uh, we only have a very short um, you know, window where we can actually extend the treaty. Um, and unfortunately, neither, uh, well, the United States in particular, but neither Russia nor the US appears particularly interested in doing that right now. So. Um, for those of us who work in the NGO space, a lot of the work that we do is aimed at trying to come up with ways to um, to push policymakers to extend extend the treaty. Um, I've talked a lot about the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and the fact that it hasn't yet entered into force. And thinking about ways to get that treaty in force is is something that remains very very important. So even though the CTBT has created a normative environment where um, you know, nuclear testing is is a taboo, I would say, in large part. We've seen that in the response to North Korea's nuclear weapons tests. Um, a taboo isn't the same as a legally binding instrument that prevents a country in a verifiable way from testing a nuclear weapon. Um, and that's really what we need if we want to prevent a return to widespread testing and widespread arms racing. So um, in some of the work that I do, I've, I am part of some of a, the sort of next generation of, of experts who are working on CTBT issues. And a lot of what we try to do is come up with creative arguments that would um, help to push policymakers in the, the remaining eight countries that need to ratify to think about doing so. And um, there are a lot of, you know, reasons from a security standpoint why it would be good for, for example, US national security interests to ratify the treaty. It would um, it continues to give us access to data that comes from the international monitoring system that I mentioned previously that's able to detect in all these different ways whether a test has been conducted. You know, that's something that, that the U.S. isn't capable of doing through its own national technical means. So we need access to this international monitoring system uh, and treaty signature and ratification gives us access to that. Um, it would also constrain Russia. So if we're worried in the United States among policymakers that, that you know, Russia might conduct a nuclear test, us withdrawing from the treaty or not being a part of the treaty lessens the political consequences for a country like Russia to testing. So there is an importance um, to us signing on to the treaty in the United States, to China signing on to the treaty, which also needs to do so. Um, and we spend a lot of time uh, you know, in, in our office thinking about ways to kind of advance, advance the entry into force of the treaty 
um, even despite challenging political circumstances. And I'll just pause here to note as well that um, you know, traditionally the United States has always been in favor of ratifying the CTPT, even when um, it's seemed like that is going to be very difficult. So um, you know, there has always been a recognition since the conclusion of the treaty in the United States and in Washington that the treaty does something important for international security. Um, but under the current administration, our new nuclear posture review says that we're no longer going to pursue ratification in the United States. There has been um, interest, I would say, among you know, lawmakers and, and policymakers in Washington in perhaps even unsigning the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And I regard that as a really dangerous um, uh, trend and, and a move that would have serious implications for US national security. So that's something that is, is you know, preoccupying for, for those of us in the field today. Um, I mentioned the Non-Proliferation Treaty. That's this cornerstone of the non-proliferation regime that kind of underpins um, uh, you know, many of the other multilateral and bilateral agreements and negotiations that, that go into preventing the spread of weapons of mass destruction. And um, I mentioned as well at the outset that we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the entry into force of that treaty. So um, the, the, the conference, so the state's parties to the treaty meet um, every five years to have a big review conference where they look at you know, how much progress have we made towards implementing this grand bargain that's at the center of the treaty? Have we made progress in implementing past commitments that we've agreed to in the setting? And they try to come up with a consensus document um, where they um, are able to characterize the progress that they've made so far and identify some steps forward that they'd like to take in the future. Um, and that's really a very difficult task when you have, you know, 190 states with very, very diverse interests and diverse threat perceptions trying to come to sort, some sort of a consensus about how to talk about, about nuclear weapons and where to go from here. Um, we did not have, uh, we were not able to agree on a consensus final document in 2015, so that's the last time um, this treaty, this, this uh, conference met and tried to do this. And um, I am becoming increasingly pessimistic that we will be able to do that in, in 2020, which is the next time this group of states um, will meet. We've gotten a couple of previews of what, what the contentious issues will be because um, the states parties to the treaty meet periodically in the lead up to these big review conferences. They meet once a year um, to start to identify some of the issues and to try to come up with some recommendations that they can use at the review conferences. And uh, those meetings have been um, already quite contentious. We see, for example, the United States and the Russian Federation, which have typically been um, very close on NPT issues, appearing to be very much at odds. There's um, a, a mechanism that you can use in the treaty to um, express your right of reply, and both the United States and the Russian Federation over the last couple of years have made ample use of, of that mechanism and, and really sort of gone at each other um, in the NPT, accusing each other of, of um, you know, not upholding their responsibilities under that treaty. Um, and that's something that is, is very unusual and is a big departure from the past. So I foresee that the disintegration of the U.S.-Russia relationship will be very disruptive to the 2020 NPT Review Conference. And I think that that will have a big ripple effect on, on um, whether states parties are able to agree to anything in this setting. Um, we can also uh, predict that there's a new instrument called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons that was concluded in 2017, which is a ban on nuclear weapons to which the nuclear weapon states have not signed on. And um, there is a lot of concern among states parties, some states parties in the non-proliferation treaty setting that the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons will be a big distraction or somehow um, kind of leach the credibility of the NPT. And so I think that that's also a topic that is going to come up quite a bit uh, at the 2020 NPT meeting. Um, I also think you know, challenges posed by, by North Korea's testing of nuclear weapons and development of the nuclear weapons capability is something that could be a topic of conversation. Um, you would think that it would be, but sometimes in the NPT setting, the issues that you, you think would be the most prominent are actually not the ones that sort of get addressed on the floor. So that may or may not happen, but 
Um, I'm sure that there will be some discussion of North Korea and its, and its development of nuclear weapons there. I also think we're likely to see um, you know, Iran and what, is, what Iran is going to do in the wake of the US abrogation of, of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, as a, a big topic of conversation in 2020. And um, that's the kind of issue that could potentially um, prevent the state's parties from reaching some kind of consensus because they can't agree on language to address those types of problems. So um, all of this means that we're headed for a very contentious meeting in 2020, um, which is too bad in some respects because it's the 50th anniversary of, of the NPT and this would be a great moment to kind of tout everything that the treaty has contributed to preventing the spread of weapons of mass destruction. Um, but I think that even that, even agreement on that is going to be very challenging because of all of these other issues that, that will make um, coming to some kind of a consensus challenging. So states parties are gonna need to think about um, the degree to which they place importance on coming to a consensus on, on something versus accurately reflecting the very real rifts that divide um, uh, a large group of countries, all of which have very different um, perspectives on what is happening and different threat perceptions. Um, so just to sum all of this up, there are a lot of nuclear weapons today, as you saw in the first slide, but there used to be a lot more of them. So I'll just remind you that, as I said, um, the numbers of nuclear weapons that the United States and the Russian Federation have today represent about an 84% cut from their Cold War height. So this really is a very significant drop, but we still have quite a long ways to go. There are also opportunities for further progress, but there are major challenges. So some of the opportunities that I see are the entry into force of the CTBT. That's something that would be a major contribution. Um, I see figuring out how to you know, freeze North Korea's nuclear weapons development is something that would represent a contribution, but it also poses major, major challenges. Um, figuring out what to do um, with respect to Iran in the wake of the US pulling out of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that's an opportunity, but it also prevents challenges because this US administration does not seem interested in, in reaching an agreement with Iran. Um, so there are all of these, these um, creative approaches that we could take to prevent the further spread of nuclear weapons and to move us towards nuclear disarmament, but there are also a lot of barriers that stand in our way to doing that. Um, thinking, you know, some of these are related to, to regional and international security issues that do impact upon prospects for non-proliferation and prospects for disarmament. So here, again, we're thinking about, you know, the state of U.S.-Russia relations, um, the perceived threats that the two countries pose to one another, and the way that that um, incentivizes, or in this case, disincentivizes the two countries from, from giving up nuclear weapons or reducing the numbers of nuclear weapons that they have or um, foregoing certain capabilities. Those are all things that affect the security environment and then have an influence on the pace of, of disarmament or proliferation. Um, one thing that I haven't talked a lot about, but that is, is often a subject of conversation is what to do about non-state actors. So um, everything I've spoken about before is about, um, uh, you know, countries that possess a nuclear capability or governments that are developing a nuclear weapons capability or would like to, but there are plenty of, you know, terrorist organizations or non-state actors who would also like to have a nuclear capability. How do we prevent, um, you know, uh, uh, something, an organization like ISIS from getting their hands on uh, a nuclear weapon or enough nuclear material to create an improvised device that would disseminate this material. Those are all considerations that people who are in the policy space have to think about in addition to all of these other challenges. Um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in that we'll talk about again on Friday is whether there are lessons that we can learn from the past. So in an environment that looks increasingly like the Cold War where you have these sort of geopolitical issues that are uh, frustrating efforts towards disarmament and towards arms control, you know, how can we look to the history books to figure out how the United States and the Soviet Union were still capable of doing arms control um, at similar moments when the high political environment wasn't really conducive to this. 
Um, so that's, that was the subject of, of the book that Masako mentioned in her, in her introduction. And that's something we'll talk a little bit more about in a couple of days. Um, so I think I'm going to end here. And I know that Masako has some discussion questions, but if there's anyone who's watching live, I'd love to answer your questions as well. Um, so I'm going to put on my headphones and, and we can get to a conversation. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Great. Yeah, so thank you for your very comprehensive lectures. And uh, it sounds like there are so many challenges in nuclear field, and there are so many things that uh, we have to solve, or I don't know if uh, there is any solutions, but uh, at least we should try. <laughs> so you said, uh, since you are going to give a lecture on uh, US-Russia in a couple of days, I try not to focus on US-Russia today, but uh, since uh, when we talk about nuclear weapons, of course, there is uh, no way to avoid these two countries. So you said uh, more than 90% of nuclear weapons are possessed by the United States and Russia. And uh, when, you look, when we looked at this uh, uh, infographic, like a yeah. map, so there are so many huge discrepancies as you see, you know, uh, even China mm -hmm. has only 280, less than 300 uh, nuclear weapons. So, but recently we hear a lot of uh, discussion about uh, threat and the importance of China engaging in nuclear disarmament or arms control discussion. So what's your view on engaging China in more I don't know if we, I can say constructive or effective, but uh, how, when, can, when the best timing to bring China in the multilateral disarmament negotiation? Yeah, that's a great question, Masako. Um, and it's a really challenging one because as you yourself pointed out, there is this huge discrepancy between the number of nuclear weapons that Russia and the United States have and what China has. And um, there has been this proposal following the um, collapse of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty to sort of conclude a follow on negotiation that would somehow involve China. Um, the same thing with the New START Treaty. And China has, in my sort of read, been very clear that they are not interested in doing this until a point where the United States and Russia have reduced their numbers of nuclear weapons to something that is more comparable to, to what China has. But, um, you know, our job is to look for creative ways to, to engage all countries that have nuclear weapons um, and, and, you know, to, to kind of see how we can circumvent some of these challenges. And some of the ideas that I have heard that I think are interesting are, um, you know, asymmetric arms control. So rather than looking at reducing the numbers of nuclear weapons that countries have, you know, talking to Russia and China about what the greatest perceived threats that they see are, and figuring out how we as the United States might be able to say, okay, you know, we will do something about ballistic missile defense if uh, you, Russia, will reduce your number of X, Y, and Z missiles, and you, China, will agree to give up some other capability. And so kind of figuring out ways um, where, you know, three countries that have very different capabilities could each agree to limit a behavior or limit a capability that they have, even if it's not all the same capability, could kind of let us get around the issue of, of you know, very quantitative reductions, which I don't think are really possible um, right now. And I'll just add as well that, you know, I, I didn't kind of mention um, the P5 process in the context of the non-proliferation treaty, but um, there, since these five countries, the US, the United Kingdom, France, um, China, and, and Russia are the five nuclear weapon states that are, you know, permitted to have nuclear weapons under the non-proliferation treaty um, over the last probably 10 years, there has been a move to ask those five countries to kind of come up with some creative proposals to move the disarmament process forward. And so there could be some way of discussing multilateral arms control and the role that nuclear weapons play in nuclear doctrines in those five countries in that 
as part of that P5 process um, that might even be, in some respects, easier than trying to actually negotiate a trilateral arms control agreement between the three countries. Okay, thank you. So I want to ask some kind of a broader question. So during the Cold War, uh, you mentioned that we had uh, almost 70,000 nuclear weapons. So, and the US and Russia uh, reduced by 84% around. Mm -hmm. So that sounds quite a lot of a reduction. And during the Cold War, of course, there are lots of uh, quite a significant uh, risk that nuclear weapons might be used. But uh, I also often hear that lots of nuclear experts said, currently, even uh, actually almost uh, 25 years after the Cold War, the danger of the risk, uh, sorry, <laughs> dangers of the nuclear weapons use might have increased. So like uh, we often hear that, although the number is uh, uh, reduced, but uh, risk of use might have increased. That's what sometimes I hear that kind of a statement. So what do you think about uh, the, the risk of use of nuclear weapons? Um, so I, I would agree with that. And, and, you know, it's hard to know and it's hard to quantify risk. But um, in the height of the Cold War, yes, there were a lot of nuclear weapons and um, a lot more than we have today. But the United States and the Soviet Union had a degree of trust and transparency and to some extent, even an assumption um, in certain circles and certain circumstances that the other side probably wouldn't launch a first strike attack on, on them. And so you could sort of assume that that probably wouldn't um, uh, you know, happen. And today, I don't think that there is that same assumption. We've lost a lot of the trust between the major players on both sides. So you can see if you're in the United States, the rhetoric about Russia in, in Washington that comes out of Washington is um, very much casting Russia in the role of, a, of an adversary or an enemy um, among, you know, even sort of the implementers of policy on both sides, they have very few opportunities to interact with one another and to build that type of personal rapport that Russian and Soviet um, policymakers um, had during the height of the Cold War. So um, there's an interesting chart that we show in our book, and maybe I can put it in the presentation on Friday, where we kind of compare the number of, of uh, fora where Russian and American or Soviet and American policymakers would have had the chance to meet one another at the height of the Cold War with, with what we see today. And um, it's just incomparable. So in that environment, um, if there in today's environment, if there's some sort of miscalculation or a miscommunication or a close call, which we know there will be because we have seen that so many times in the past, um, I'm not sure that we can count on the Russian or American decision makers who are, you know, there to alert um, their higher ups to a nuclear uh, potential nuclear attack to assume that the other side has made a mistake or made a miscalculation or is communicating something incorrectly. I think the assumption would be we are under attack and we need to launch a retaliatory strike. And that's the kind of environment um, of tension and of mistrust that can really lead to something very dangerous and escalatory that I think is actually a significant difference from the height of the Cold War, even though that seems um, you know, a little bit counterintuitive. Great, yeah, thank you. It sounds very scary. <laughs> but, uh, related to uh, what you said, so, you said the INF Treaty, Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, was already no longer, <laughs> it's just the uh, United States withdrew, so it doesn't exist anymore. So the only treaty is New START. So, but the prospect is also very difficult. So 
what I, I guess many students or many people are thinking, what if the New START Treaty is not uh, extended? What's gonna happen? Of, it's difficult to predict in your view, what is going to happen between the United States and Russia? Um, it is hard to predict. Um, and I think a lot depends in some respects on you know, whether there is a change in administration in the United States or whether the current administration um, stays on during the next election. But if there are no more limits on the number of nuclear weapons that either the United States or Russia can have, I think we're in an environment where both sides um, have enough uh, proponents of building up a nuclear capability that we would see a return to widespread nuclear arms racing. So I think that there are, you know, um, there are some people who are in the governments of both countries, career civil servants, who I don't think would advocate for this, but I do think both countries have enough, um, you know, bureaucratic drivers for a buildup of nuclear weapons that if there were not a cap in place, we would see a return to arms racing. I also think you know, in an environment where there is no ban on nuclear testing because the CTBT isn't yet in force, we could see the development of new types of nuclear weapons. Now, of course, the New START Treaty wouldn't necessarily be able to prevent that from happening anyway, but um, it's at least one barrier from a return to that type of arms racing that I think can often lead to, to new types of nuclear weapons. And without a ban on nuclear testing, um, uh, both the United States and the Russian Federation could, um, could conduct the type of explosive testing that you would need to do to develop those new types of nuclear weapons. And I think that could really take us into some dangerous uncharted territory that would look a lot more like the, the kind of height of the Cold War before we had these multilateral regimes in place to keep things in check uh, than anything that we've seen in the last 50 years. Okay, sounds like our discussion is moving into quite a doom's day direction. But uh, still, I would like to ask uh, another little bit difficult question. So what's the impact, I mean, the increasing arms race between the United States and Russia? What's the impact to other countries? That's a great question. I mean, it's we don't, we don't talk about that as much and um, you know, as somebody who focuses almost single-mindedly on U.S.-Russia relations, it's I, I, I'm often sort of that's my mode. But you're exactly right that other countries are watching too. Um, you know, there are a lot of reasons why countries proliferate, and not all of them are rational or have to do with the threats that they see coming from other countries. So, you know, just because the United States and Russia are engaged in an arms race doesn't necessarily mean that France is going to think that it suddenly needs to build up its nuclear weapons or that, you know, South Korea decides that it needs to develop a nuclear weapons capability. Those aren't necessarily um, the, the, you know, developments that will for sure follow on if there's a return to arms racing between the two largest nuclear weapon states. But um, it might, you know, there's, there's also not a lot in place to prevent that from happening. And I think other countries see the breakdown in US-Russia relations across a lot of different platforms, not just in arms racing. So I mentioned the Non-Proliferation Treaty. You know, there are 190 countries there that are watching what the US and Russia are doing and wondering about the credibility of, of the non-proliferation regime as a whole if those two countries aren't able to work together on those issues. And that in combination with seeing a resurgence of arms racing and the development of new kinds of capabilities is really the kind of thing that could make, um, you know, some people in uh, third countries think, gosh, we should really develop our own capability or we really need to, to, to start building up our own arsenal so that we aren't, um, you know, that we can defend ourselves and um, if we can't rely on the United States or whatever to come to our defense, we need to make sure that we can defend ourselves if anything were to happen. So it's kind of a, um, you know, holistic disruption of all of the, the regimes and norms and um, 
um, I guess, optics that have been keeping uh, proliferation in check for a long time. And so I think that there could be a very widespread ripple effect uh, and possibly in ways that we're not even anticipating now. Okay, thank you. So on a little bit more positive side, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, this is a really great opportunity for all the students to understand how dangerous situation we are living right now. And uh, unfortunately, um, you know, the Atten not, no, not so many younger generations are paying attention to this uh, very important issue. So this is a really great opportunity for all the students to think this issue more uh, seriously. Mm -hmm. I'm not really, you know, threatening, but it's a really good opportunity to study. So uh, related to study, you mentioned that uh, you also talked about the comprehensive nuclear testament treaty quite a lot, and uh, you belong to the CTBTO youth group, next generation experts. And uh, so the group is trying to come up with some creative idea uh, to bring the CTBT uh, into force, enter into force. So could you share some uh, like a discussion or what kind of a creative idea you have? Uh, perhaps uh, lots of ideas, but maybe if you could share some ideas. Sure. So, um... There are, yes, as you said, lots of creative ideas for, you know, ways to, to try to advance the entry into force of the treaty. And um, some of the ones that, um, that I think are particularly useful would be, for instance, if, um, okay, so I'm going to find the slide where I was showing one of the um, monitor, one of the components of the monitoring system. So under the text of the treaty, um, each country, for the most part, is supposed to host monitoring stations on its territory. And those are actually written out in the treaty itself, um, with a couple of exceptions where states didn't want to have their monitoring systems listed for whatever reason. Um, but even though the international monitoring system has been very, very significantly built up, there are still a number of those eight countries that still need to ratify the treaty in order for it to enter into force that haven't yet built their monitoring stations. And these include, you know, India, um, they include, um, you know, Iran has built its monitoring stations, but it doesn't transmit data from them to the big data center that analyzes all of the data uh, in Vienna. And I think that um, one step towards advancing the entry into force of the treaty would be for these countries to actually build their monitoring stations or in the cases where they've already built them to start transmitting those data to the international uh, data center. And I think that that could be an opportunity for um, to build closer institutional ties between the governments of those countries and the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. It could also help give them some more credible assurance that their neighbors, so, you know, for India, this would be Pakistan, wouldn't conduct a clandestine test without it being detected. Um, and that could help to kind of perhaps alleviate some of the tensions that are, and the mistrust that is preventing some of these countries from wanting to ratify the treaty. And it wouldn't entail an immediate commitment to go ahead and ratify, which might make it kind of more politically appealing. So that's one idea that um, I think could hold some water. And uh, it's those types of things that sound, you know, very small and specific, but would actually be quite significant that, that we try to highlight in our work. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so you said that there are many different, lots of ideas. And if we go to CTBTO website, can we find those ideas on the website? Yep, there should be some information written up about, you know, highlighting the work of the different youth group members. There are okay. hundreds of them now. Okay. So, um, so some of them get published in different outlets, but um, on the website there, there should at least be some kind of written, um, you know, articles or op-eds or things like that that the website highlights that, that talk about some of these proposals. 
Great, that's wonderful. Because for the Critical Issues Forum project, we are really encouraging students to have a creative thinking, developing critical thinking skills. And eventually, we always want students to come up with their own solution after you have studied this complicated non-proliferation issues. So I think the activities done by CTV to youth group is going to be really a great example for the city uh, critical issues for our student, mm -hmm. students as well. So I'm going to have, I have a final question, which I really hope that I can draw some positive <laughs> things about, uh, um, you know, for it's, no doubt, the current nuclear situation is very difficult, lots of challenges. So that's why we are conducting this uh, education project. And uh, we have uh, US students, Russian students, and Japanese students. So do you have uh, any advice for these younger generations, how they could uh, continue to study? How, well, especially, uh, you know, currently, there are lots of attention to the climate change, mm -hmm. you know, thanks to Greta Thunberg, but not so many uh, young students are paying attention to the nuclear issues. Do you have uh, any like a suggestion to enhance or increase more awareness among the younger generations? Yeah, it's a really tough question. Um, and, um, you know, both of us work on education issues. And um, this is a topic that I think we really wrestle with a lot in our field is, is exactly how to get young people in particular to kind of focus on these issues. I think part of the challenge um, is that this doesn't feel like an immediate threat because unlike climate change where we can really see the impacts right now, we can you know see temperatures rising, we can see water levels rising. Um, with nuclear weapons, as I said at the outset of the presentation, they've only been used, you know, one time in war, thankfully. Um, and so for students who are in college today or in high school today, you know, that doesn't necessarily feel like something that they should be worried about in their day to day. Um, but, you know, what I think can be um, particularly useful is in classrooms to highlight for students, you know, how it is that that their skill sets tie into nuclear issues or why it is that nuclear issues or WMD issues are relevant to the topics that they're already interested in. So, for instance, in a, you know, a Soviet history class, I can imagine introducing a unit about the Soviet development of the atomic bomb. And that could be one way to help students who are already interested, I'm thinking of my own background here, in, in kind of Russia issues, to understand that their skills are actually applicable to non-proliferation and arms control issues as well. Or, you know, I know we're focused on, on nuclear questions here, but um, in, a, in a biology class, you could talk about gene editing technology and what the potential proliferation implications of, of those technologies might be um, with respect to biological weapons. And so those are just kind of ways that I think on the educator side, um, people can help students with a lot of very diverse interests see where their unique skills and interests might um, kind of butt up against our field. Um, but, you know, the news is also a great way of doing this. So I think nuclear weapons, particularly in some respects, <laughs> thanks to North Korea and North Korea's development of nuclear weapons, those are things that are in the news all the time. And for students who are interested in civics and interested in uh, current events and foreign affairs, you know, those are some very ready hooks that I think um, point out very clearly why it is that nuclear weapons and non-proliferation more broadly are so um, relevant today. And so, uh, again, on kind of the educator side, encouraging students to look at some of those issues and help them understand them, I think, is one way of driving home their ongoing relevance uh, today. Thank you so much, Sarah. So let's follow the important news. <laughs> it's so important to continue to study this uh, uh, challenging topic. But as Sarah said, this is a really important topic for younger generations to study. So I hope uh, we can continue to study this topic together. And uh, 
hopefully uh, you can come up with a very creative uh, solution. And uh, I look forward to uh, hear your solution at the spring conference. So thank you so much, Sarah. So I would like to conclude today's session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.